So, where do you see yourself in 10 years? I remember thinking about that question possibly for the first time in my life when I was 15. It was in the 10th grade, it was English Lit, and I was given an essay assignment with that prompt. And I remember thinking hard about it. It took me some time to write. I actually still remember vividly the picture I painted of the future that I wanted to live. I lived at home in my own studio apartment and I lived alone. The scene I depicted was me on a video conference call giving a seminar presentation on my research on the cure of the common cold, wearing a shirt and suit on top and shorts outside the camera view, and that automatic coffee maker going in the background. So I was a research scientist by trade, finding cures to diseases during the day, but at night, I also worked as a software programmer working for Microsoft to help fund you know, my research. And that was back in 1996, when the internet was just starting to become a bigger thing, a few years before Google and Zoom and all that. Pretty forward thinking, huh? And so what about for you? Think back. Where did you see yourself in 10 years when you were in high school? So go ahead and write it into the chat. For me, back then, that picture would have been an awesome life, living in the confines of my own space with all the creature comforts, getting to do what I wanted without many people to bother me or to deal with, doing the kind of work that I thought would be fun and also bring me fame and fortune. And that picture captured the grand vision that I had for my life. I thought it was quite a noble and fulfilling life, you know, benefiting others, contributing to society, being world-renowned, respected, doing good, and not hurting anyone. It was, it was an ideal life. And so in college, I set out to do that. I entered college intending to double major in molecular and cell biology and computer science. And then I was also looking forward to freedom from parents and getting to do whatever I wanted. Hi, my name is Richard Chen, and I'm one of the leads out here in our church in North Carolina. Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. As we've been doing, you know, in our Unashamed series, I wanted to share with you the story of how I was saved and chose to follow Christ. You know, it's been 30 years since that 10-year vision that I wrote in 10th grade, and some things have kind of changed since then. I grew up going to church and even got baptized at 13, but I stopped going in the last two years of high school when I lost my faith in Christianity and organized religion. And things started to change, though, when I started college and started going back to church. And after a couple years of spiritual struggle, I decided to follow Jesus and become Christian on May 4th, 2002, my senior year in college, a few weeks before graduating. And so today I want to talk to you about that, about choices. You know, when you're 18 years old, deciding what college to go to, choosing what to major in. I mean, it could be such a big drama, you know, and, and it seems like such a big deal. And the times when you're unable to get what you want, you know, you're not able to get into that computer science or business major or get into that grad school or med school. It can feel like your life is over and there's just not much more to live for. But those are not the most important choices that you need to make in life. In fact, I want to submit to you the most important choices are the ones that have to do with these questions. Whom will I serve? In other words, who am I living for? You know, the choice of who you are going to follow. What's the purpose of life? What should I do? There's a choice of what kind of person you're going to become. There's one life that I have. What can I live my life for? And so a big part of life is the choices that you make in life and how you answer these big questions. There's key moments in your life when you gotta sit down and you gotta think about what you're gonna do about those questions. For me, it was during my last church retreat in college. It was with all the seniors before we were going to graduate and I had the chance to really think about what I was gonna to choose to do with my life. I was still trying to figure out where I stood with Christianity. And the pastor preached on Joshua 24 verse 14 to 15, which reads, Now therefore, fear the Lord, and serve Him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your fathers served in the region beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So choose this day whom you will serve. Who was I going to serve? You know, this whole thing was regarding the choice of who I was going to follow. And that was the fork in the road moment for me. You see, I had been thinking and struggling over the past couple of years about this very question. 
and was in a state of spiritual limbo. I, I did not want to follow God and I was not following God. I wanted to live my own life and do what I wanted. And I was conscious, very conscious of the consequences. If I had died that day, I knew I would be going to hell, living a life forever separated from God. But at that time, I just didn't really care. And where was this rebellious attitude coming from? You know, in order to answer this question, I need to give you a snapshot of what I was like in college. If I was honest, this is how my friends would have described me. Selfish. I was quite a selfish person. In college, during finals week, I would retreat to my cave. I refused to be bothered while I crammed all day and all night. And why? Because I wanted to get my A's, and I was desperate to make sure that I would. And that's what often occupied my concerns and worry because that was my ticket to achieve my dreams. And one time my friends were trying to get me out of the computer lab while I was working on a CS project for just, you know, just a couple hours to celebrate actually one of my best friend's birthday. And that friend, Kevin, you know, we were longtime friends since junior high school. We were in the same computer class uh, working together on the same project even. But in that moment, you know, I just was cold hearted, stubborn. I didn't want to let go of my time, didn't want to leave my seat. And so my friends actually left for his birthday dinner. They went out and then in a couple hours came back to the lab and I was still there. I just had kept working and working. Whenever school got busy, anything else that would threaten that, you know, whether it be friends or church, you know, my heart and my room for others would suddenly shrivel up like a prune. My friends said that I was like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And there was moments where I would switch with this scary intensity. You know, whenever an exam came around, I would always make it very clear non-verbally that I didn't want people around. I didn't want to be disturbed. I didn't want to hang out. And actually, in fact, later on, they, they said they got, they got quite scared of me. But when it came to something like doing research in the lab, you know, I would try to spend all my extra time there, you know, sometimes even staying late into the night running experiments. I was more than willing to spend extra time there, but not at church or even just hanging out with my friends. And more and more, I saw those things that were outside of classwork, classwork and academics as, as threatening. And so this was a snapshot of the person I had become. You know, in the pursuit of my purpose in life, to achieve my dream life, a dream job, I had become intensely selfish. I was only interested in myself, pursuing my own dreams, and I had very little care or interest toward others. And I was blind to my own self-centeredness, and let alone had, had any interest in, in caring or loving others, let alone matters of eternity and saving lost souls. So who was I following? I was following myself. The only person I lived for, really, was myself. You know, going back to that state of spiritual limbo I was in, intellectually, I was actually convinced of the truth claims of Christianity, but I just wasn't ready. I didn't want to submit my life to follow Christ. And frankly put, I didn't want to do what someone else was going to tell me to do, you know, even if it was God. Yet I would, you know, go through these phases of, of that intense stubbornness and cold heartedness toward God with no sense of contrition, and I just didn't care. And I would also go through other phases of existential fear, like what's going to come of my life? Like what about my eternal destiny when I die? And during this period, I would experience the Word of God coming alive and speaking to me at opportune times. But in the end, I still would feel stuck and unable to resolve this spiritual tension in my heart, unable to decide. Thankfully, mercifully, and perhaps miraculously, God intervened to chip away at my stubborn, rebellious heart and, and eventually became softened toward Him. And the truth is that, you know, God, He never forces us to follow Him. However, God makes His invitation through His Word, through the Bible and His people. He makes it clear. His Word is clear about what He's calling us to, inviting us to. And there's a choice that's put before each of us. And we can either choose to follow God and to serve Him and to keep choosing to do so, and so then grow closer to God and others, or to choose to follow other gods and to serve them. And as we keep choosing to do so, actually choose to move away from God and isolate ourselves from others. And so today I wanted to share my story of how I chose to follow God. And so my senior year in college, um, I had this first year English literature requirement that I waited all the way to my last semester to take. And the theme I chose was identity and the individual. And I happened to have a Christian graduate student instructor. Our first assignment was to present on a poem about identity. Somehow I was drawn to this poem written by Dietrich Bonhoeffer while he was in prison entitled, Who Am I? And I was intrigued by this title, Who Am I? It was a key existential question that I myself was struggling with, and I was wondering if he might have some answers to my question. And so I chose to present on it. What it taught me was a key lesson. Our identity is defined by our relationships. 
This poem was written by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a modern hero of faith. He was a German pastor and advocate on behalf of Jews during the Nazi regime, and he had helped some even escape Germany. He played a leading role in a Protestant resistance movement opposing Hitler, and he was imprisoned for his opposition and eventually executed by hanging in April of 1945. And it was while he was in prison that he wrestled with that question, who am I? Was it what others saw him and how they praised him? Or was he all the fears and the worry that he felt inside? And he came to, the, his, to, to a conclusion that his primary identity wasn't the insp inspirational, emotionally steady, heroic person that others saw him as, you know, the many people that looked up to him, uh, persecuted yet calm and hopeful toward his captors and standing firm in the face of justice, all of that. Nor was his primary identity all of those inward fears, the hopelessness he felt, the weakness, the weariness, and feeling like a hypocrite, you know, the things that only he himself knew about himself. And so he concludes this poem with these lines, Who am I? They mock me, these lonely questions of mine. Whoever I am, thou knowest, O God, I am thine. And so the answer to this existential question comes from the response of another question. Who did God say he was? Who does God say you are? What God reminded Bonhoeffer was simply, you are mine. I am thine. Isn't that all that matters at the end of the day? I mean, in, in, larger, in light of this larger truth that God claims you as his own, I mean, who cares what others say about you? Who cares what you even say about yourself? Or even if our assessment about ourselves is accurate, as Bonhoeffer's might have been, what really matters, what truly matters at the end of the day is that you have a creator and that your creator and what your creator says about you, that you belong to God. In, in Isaiah 43, 1, you know, it's a verse that came alive for many of us recently, you know, through this uh, TV show called The Chosen about Jesus. It says this, But now thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. And these words tell us that God has created us, He has formed us, He redeemed us, He has called us by name, and He tells us, You are mine. Who am I? In Bonhoeffer's words, we can reply, God, I am thine. So what does that mean? My identity and therefore my worth was not defined by what I did or could become or accomplish or even how I could improve it as a person. All that is, is just rubbish. Our identity rests firmly in the fact that we belong to God. And so now, what are the implications of all this? Well, our relationship with God is therefore primary, and it ought to dominate, be authoritative regarding how we view ourselves. And so let's take 30 seconds to think about what I've talked about so far, and jot down in your notebook your answer to these questions around the question of, who am I? So, who am I? Who are you? You belong to God. God created you. He formed you. We do not will ourselves into existence, not even one cell. Our existence and life is completely owed to others, including people like our parents who raised us, cared for us when we were helpless infants. And ultimately, it traces back to God, who brought life itself into existence. 
Not only did God create you and form you, He also redeemed you and He called you. And how do we know that God redeemed us? Well, He redeemed us by sending His own beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to sacrifice His life on our behalf. And by that, we know we are like His beloved children. And that is such a basic yet fundamental truth. And that was an overwhelming truth when I actually sat down and started to think about it, that God created me, He formed me, He redeemed me, and He called me. Now, if God has created us, He also actually has a rightful authority to tell us what to do and how to live. And as a loving Heavenly Father, we can also trust that He desires to actually give us the best. And as a father myself now, you know, that's my heart's desire as I think about my children, Isaac and Audrey, you know, to actually want their best. And so given these truths, it became clear to me that to assert my own autonomy sounded more and more absurd. And now, not only absurd, but actually rebellious. I was rejecting God's love. Rebellion against God isn't just, you know, sinning in the traditional ways that when we think about sin, but actually when I made my life only about my pursuits, you know, no matter how noble or ignoble they were, the bottom line is that before God, this is rebellion. And that is how our true identity, found in our relationship with God, addresses our sinful rebellion for ultimate authority over our lives. My attitude had been, God, why can't I just do what I want to do? You know, I did not see what was wrong with wanting to do what I wanted with my life. I had a warped view of God as one who was threatening, someone who wanted to take away good things from my life. However, around that time during Easter, I saw clearly how my basic desire for ultimate autonomy and authority in my life was, was a deeply hurtful rejection of God as my loving Father. This desire for autonomy, when placed next to the heart of a loving Father for His beloved children, it's, it's wrong and it's ugly and it's offensive. And so perhaps for the first time that Easter, I saw that my desire for autonomy, what it actually looked like. It's Jesus, beaten, mocked, rejected, scourged, suffering on the cross. My rejection of God's authority in my life, you know, it isn't without effect. It actually deeply affects God. And I saw the ugliness of my sins and selfishness upon a God who had only sought to love me. I saw the true weight of my sin for the first time and made this connection that that something that I had initially thought was innocuous, you know, that whole attitude of, really, just, just leave me alone, please. That attitude, when directed toward a loving God who extended His hand of friendship and everlasting love toward me, that was deeply hurtful and rejecting. And so finally, I came to a conclusion and conviction that my desire for autonomy was my fundamental sin that I needed to really repent of. And so how about for you? Like maybe you've claimed yourself to be a Christian for some time, but have you seen your desire for autonomy for what it is? You know, it's sin and rebellion against God. Have you, re have you repented of your desire for autonomy from God in your life? Have you forgotten your identity as God's beloved child? And are you running away from home, unaware of how that act of running away has broken the heart of your Heavenly Father? And so in addition to my desire for autonomy over my life, the second area I had to work out was my desire for the world. Now, growing up, I had a romanticized view of science. It was my dream, you know, to be a famous research scientist one day. And so, when, you know, when I was in high school, during a summer program at Harvard, I remember walking by myself through the molecular biology research buildings, going up and down the hallways and peering down into the various labs, looking at various equipment and, and just being in awe of what I thought was world-class science. And I imagined how big discoveries were being made there, you know. And in fact, there were these two rhinos these two rhino sculptures in front of um, the entrance to the building, which I thought was the coolest thing because that was my favorite animal. And I thought, man, this must be the sign of my future destiny. It might seem a little bit odd to you, you know? And, and yeah, it, it was. But the feeling is almost like this. It's kind of like walking through some sports hall of fame or being able to walk through a grand stadium like Yankee Stadium. And you, you look at all the various memorabilia with the, the tour guide going through the history of the players who walked in those halls. I mean, it was that kind of awe. Of course, to my disappointment, I didn't end up getting into Harvard, you know, as an undergrad. But I thought, okay, well, maybe grad school. And so come college, I worked hard, and that was my ambition. And come senior year, I applied to grad schools, and I got uh, several interviews, including two programs at Harvard, and I was admitted to both, you know, the Biological Biomedical Sciences Program, Molecular and Cell Biology Programs, and you can imagine how excited I was. And so here I was there on my interviews, walking around those same halls and same buildings and talking science with these research professors. And I was in their offices and talking science over lunch at nice restaurants and realizing, oh, hey, dude, that guy over there, he wrote my textbook. And, you know, up to that point, I somehow held to this idealistic view that the scientific community, 
you know, that academia was immune from the typical squabbles and dramas of human sin, competitiveness, and so on, and envy. And I imagine that, you know, the best scientists, they must have also been these upright, moral, good people. And during my interviews, you know, so there I was hanging out with the so-called best, professors, grad students, interviewees. However, at the end of one of the interview days, at, at, we were at a faculty club house at, at Harvard, and there was, you know, a dinner that was for everyone. And over the conversation, I remember thinking to myself, man, like, why does this feel kind of lame? And in an honest moment, I detected the same insecurities that we all have, sizing each other up, trying to sound smart and look cool as much as nerds can look cool. You know, many of the conversations, they just felt shallow. And I suspected that we were all just trying to really, trying really hard to sound better than we actually were. It's the same games that you find just about anywhere else. And I thought judgmentally that it was only business people and lawyers and pre-meds that were like that, you know? But reality is we're all human. We're all sinful and humans occupy the venerable halls of science too. And there was nothing that different or special about the world of science. And I remember thinking, man, is this it? Is this what I'm about to give my best years of my life to? Is this going to be worth it? During that dinner in the, the middle of the salad course, I excused myself, you know, and I left the dinner and all the remaining evening pleasantries early because I had actually already planned to go to a Bible study at Harvard. Honestly, I, I think I felt kind of glad to have an excuse to leave. And, and I still remember at once, you know, that the, the, the moment I entered into that random classroom, you know, somewhere on campus, I don't remember, to join that Bible study, I, I still remember that feeling that I had. It was this familiar feeling of just being warmly welcomed by people, you know, almost like coming home to family. And there was a genuine interest that people had in getting to know me and a genuine expression of care. And I, and I didn't have to pretend that I was better or smarter than I actually was. And I thought, man, where had I experienced this before? And that feeling reminded me of all the friends and spiritual mentors that I had back home, you know, my church back home in Berkeley. And I had to think about that. Like, why did I just feel that? And so I started to play out my life. Like, what do I really want? And, and what would adequately, what could actually adequately deliver? During that stay in Boston, uh, during the week, one of the devotion texts was, of all the passages that it could have been, it was Luke 18 on the rich young ruler. And I remember flipping to those pages in the Bible and I immediately knew, oh man, Maybe God's like trying to speak to me here, trying to show me something. And I was kind of even dreading it. And so let's read this passage. Uh, Luke 18, verse 18. And a ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he said, all these I've kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack, sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. And so this rich young ruler, that was me. I was torn. I was needing to make a choice. Why is that picture of the rich young ruler walking away sad? You know, why is that a tragic picture? It's, it's, it was sad, not because he wanted to live a good life or do good things, but it was because he wasn't choosing to live the best life. And he was unable to let go of his wealth, his potential, his comfortable life and secure future. And as a result, what was he forfeiting? It was he was forfeiting a life of following Jesus. He was forfeiting eternal life. And I was that rich young ruler. And let me just pause to clarify one really important thing here. You know, there's nothing wrong with wealth, advancing in your career and going to grad school. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with science. But the key distinction that I want to make here is that those things sometimes can become what you admire. And when you become in love with those things and when you get them and you have them and, and when they start to take the place of God, they could keep you from choosing to actually live the best life. And moreover, for this rich young ruler, was he actually a good guy? I mean, he probably didn't have to help the poor. But in fact, maybe use his wealth to create some tower and estate with high walls where he didn't ever have to see or know about the plight of others. And isolated, he never had to really interact with anyone in a meaningful way. And so when he says in verse 21, all these things I've kept from my youth, it's probably because he never really had to put himself in a position where he, where he would have to actually love and actually care for other people. And to this, what's also tragic is that he was probably blind to all that. And, and he still yet struggled to follow Jesus because he didn't see anything wrong with his life. He still thought he was a, living a decent life, a good guy, you know, fulfilling his purposes in life to obey God. And so we have to think deeply and clearly and work this out for ourselves. So for me, what was the choice for me? I was considering between the best that the world had to offer. 
and what God had to offer me. You know, the best of the world, what, what is it? Maybe fame and fortune, money, and comfortable life. But Jesus, what did he say? What did he have to offer me? Eternal life, treasure in heaven. You know, the promise of a different kind of immaterial, immaterial blessing that isn't temporary. It's a loving, restored relationship with God. And out of that, a restored relationship, a life of purpose to make my life about loving others, being able to live my life, my one life, for something that would actually last forever instead of the temporary things of this world, a life of serving God and loving people. So the rich young really, he walks away sad because he probably knew what was the right choice, but just couldn't get himself to choose it. You know, the world's pull and tangible realities in the life that he had in his hand, it was just too much for him to give up and he couldn't walk away from all that. In addition, his own blindness to the true depravity and his selfishness in his own heart and the sins of omission prevented him from really seeing his desperate state. And so what about for you? What's something that's hard for you to let go of and might actually lead you to walk away from Jesus? So let's take a moment to pause and reflect and to maybe jot that down in your notebook or your paper. For me, in my gut, I knew which was better and the right choice, but, but would I actually choose it? It was very clear to me that this was going to be a decision that I would need to settle first in my heart. In some ways, I also knew that it actually didn't really matter which grad school I chose or whether or not I even went to grad school because it was a matter of, do I want to follow Jesus or not? And once that conscious choice was made, the other choices become secondary. They just kind of fall into place on their own. And so that was a dilemma that I was in. And in fact, you know, I still did end up going to choose to go to grad school. And I just, I actually ended up not choosing to go to my dream school. And, you know, as for Harvard, well, like I said, I didn't get in as an undergrad. So the joke goes now that, you know, I've got one up on Harvard, 2v1. They rejected me once as an undergrad, but I rejected them twice. So there. <laughs> um, but choosing not to go to my dream school by then actually wasn't such a big drama. You know, the, the question of whether uh, I wanted to follow Jesus or not was still getting resolved. Around that time, I actually decided, you know, I want to stay nearby Berkeley if I could. And so I decided uh, to go to UC San Francisco, which is just about as good. And, and, so a f and also, actually, a few friends had also gotten to school there. And my sense was that God was wanting to start something there in San Francisco. And I wanted to really be a part of that and for some reason. Something was tugging at my heart. And so for me, um, still the most important choice at that point was whether I wanted to follow Jesus and resolving those questions. What was the purpose of my life? Whom would I follow? And so, like the rich young ruler, I was afraid, I was torn over what I should choose to do, what should I do, and, and, and how would I choose? And this was the spiritual battle that was raging within. I had to really wrestle with my desire for autonomy, you know, and, and for the things of this world. And I was, you know, deeply convicted of my sin and my rebellion against God at the same time. And so on that day during the retreat, I thought about these various truths that I had come to learn, and I could not simply unlearn. I could not any longer deny the truth that I was a beloved child of God, that my desire for autonomy was the core of my sin and rebellion against God, which grieved him. And that at crucial juncture, you know, at different crucial junctures during those interviews, I started to see through the hollowness and temporary nature of what the best that the world had to offer me. 
God had been speaking to me through his word, through his people, and I couldn't ignore God any longer. And I was convinced, I was convinced, but I was also convicted of these truths and the personal implications. And so, as Peter said in John 6, 68 to 69, so, so was my confession. Like, where else could I go but to Christ and at the foot of the cross? Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. And so I decided that day to repent of my sin, my desire for autonomy and the idols of the world, to receive Christ into my life as my Lord and my Savior. My, my, I committed my life to, to live the rest of it for Christ, building on Christ as my foundation with the best that I had and the best of what I could give, to live life for Christ and to follow Him wherever He would go. And once I made that choice, I felt forgiven and I felt free. My eternal destiny was set and my soul was won over for Christ. I remember feeling so joyful, no longer torn and burdened and no longer burdened by my ambition and my greed. And so that picture of me, you know, as I was an intense college student, you know, where was my life actually headed? I mean, I'm thankful for God's miraculous intervention in my life because God saved me from a really small life that would have, and, and, and I would have only grown more selfish and more inwardly focused. My life, you know, I think it would have been destructive. I, I might have been living my dream, but I shudder to think what kind of person I, I, I would have become. Cold and heartless. Like what kind of husband, what kind of dad, what kind of friend would I have become? And I probably would have been alone. Cynical toward life and a life that was burdened by many regrets. But again, in choosing to follow Christ, I found true purpose in serving God. And so I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful for the life that I live now, which is in such contrast to the life I dreamed as a student in high school and college. Looking back on my life since I became Christian, my life has been filled with so many people and so much meaningful work. I thank God for how that one decision really opened the door to many blessings, you know, including growing a heart for ministry. I learned the meaning of He called me from Isaiah 43 through experiencing the truth of Ephesians 2.10, coming to life. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we should walk in them. So after graduating, I got to take part in the start of a new ministry um, in San Francisco, and my life became filled with so much meaningful work. We reached out to graduate students, working adults in the city, and it was a challenging ministry, but I was driven by the desire to reach lost souls. I experienced so much joy in serving God together with others as one body. And I remember, man, we did a lot of different things. I did a lot of food prep, loading and unloading, setup and takedown, towing trailers, learning bass guitar, and meeting a lot of people from different walks of life who, who needed the gospel. I remember experiencing the contrast between the daily drudgery of research, you know, which most experiments seem to fail and have no significant outcome. And then the, the excitement that came from communicating gospel truths to students and friends. And, and why was that? Because it was in those meetings that I got to share my testimony, share my story, and talk about God's love, real life issues, spiritual matters, speak truths that had eternal consequences, and experience the most joyful moments of seeing someone respond to God's love and experiencing Christ's transforming power. And so place side by side, my vision, that is my ambitions, were so small and paltry compared to the grand vision that God has for broken humanity. And what greater purpose could anyone find than that? And these last three years in North Carolina, man, it's been just as joyful, though not without its challenges either. But each day is another day that I can keep choosing to follow Christ and I get to go back to my commitment that I made that day to align my response to Joshua's commitment that as for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. So beginning with that life-changing truth that I became, that, that I am a beloved child of God, that I am thine, that in spite of my sinful and rebellious heart that desired autonomy, you know, Jesus redeemed me. And that not only did he redeem me, but he called me by my name to do his good work. I found my true purpose in serving God. And beginning with the fact that, that who I am is rooted in a relationship with God, as a result, my life has now been filled to the brim with many other relationships with fellow beloved children of God. And that's what I want to testify to you today. And now for you, you know, what points today from my story spoke to you? You know, the primary colors of the gospel are simple. God, He created you and He formed you. He redeemed you and He called you. And you are His beloved child. And our desire for autonomy is sin against God. Christ, He died for our, our sins. He died for your sins. And, and our sins is what put Jesus on the cross. 
And yet God extends kindness and He offers forgiveness so that we can be restored to relationship with God. And we must choose whether to follow Him or not. And we must choose to serve Him or to serve other gods and to live for things in this world. And I know the choice, it isn't always easy. It wasn't easy for me. And maybe there are some things that you need to think over for yourself. And so I want to give you a chance and a time to do that. So to wrap up, um, life is about these important questions and these choices. How will you choose? Maybe for some of you, you need to choose to follow Christ for the first time. And if that's you and you've thought about it, you could respond today by clicking on the button in the chat and someone will pray for you. Now, maybe others of you are struggling with an idol or some other good thing that is occupying your heart and you need to repent of those things and you need to recommit your life to Christ. So I want to give you a chance to think about these things. All right, let's close our time in prayer. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, you have called us your beloved children. And Lord, I just really pray that we could trust in that and to allow that basic truth to really define who we are. Lord, you remind us that, that we are created by you, that we are formed by you. And so, Lord, I pray that we would trust in your, your, your deep love for us. God, we also uh, know that you are one who has redeemed us through the cross of Jesus and his suffering for our sins. Lord, we are forgiven. And so, Lord, I pray that we can also move toward you as you have called us to follow you. Lord, I pray that each person would be able to respond rightfully to your invitation. God, you have given us the dignity to respond to you. And so, Lord, help us to choose to respond to you and to follow you and to be able to say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Be able to experience that deep joy of really living the best life. So thank you again, Lord, for this time. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.